Well, hello there, and thank you for joining me for the latest edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook. On this week's show, we're focusing on green hydrogen development and offshore wind energy. That's partly because our guest this week on Telil 24-7 is Nova Scotia's Minister for Natural Resources and Renewables, Tori Rushton. And he's going to talk to us about the new Green Hydrogen Action Plan released by the province just last week. But we're also going to take you to the Discus Civic Improvement Centre. That's where the Cape Breton Partnership and Net Zero Atlantic co-hosted one of several information sessions that took place across Cape Breton Island on Monday afternoon, December the 11th. There was a similar session set up at the Bonnie Bray Seniors Club in St. Peter's. And the Discus session was filmed by my colleague in the Telil News Department, French language journalist Jacqueline Giroir. So here is some footage from that Monday afternoon in the Scoos, which will open up with the opening presentation from Net Zero Atlantic and the Cape Breton Partnership. Let's take you to the Scoos for the discussion right now. So my name is Jennifer McNeil. I am the Green Energy Engagement Coordinator for the Cape Breton Partnership. We are a private sector-led economic development organization. We also administer two regional enterprise networks. Our work focuses on a lot of different things. We do business support, but we also do immigration work, um, workforce development, lots of lots of different things, and also the green energy engagement program. And this was set up kind of in the face of our green energy transition to have meaningful dialogue with communities like we're doing today. Today is an information session. I should have welcomed you to the information session. Um, and so this two-way knowledge sharing is really important to the partnership. We want everybody to come and, and feel like they're, they're being, that they're being heard, that we're having these conversations. And that's back to Victoria. Hi everyone, I'm Victoria. I work for Net Zero Atlantic. I'm a project manager at the organization. We are a not-for-profit research organization with our main office based in Halifax, but we have staff located around Atlantic Canada. Um, as our name suggests, we are working to advance the transition to net zero or carbon neutrality in Atlantic Canada. Uh, so we mostly work with um, our partners in government, academia, industry, other NGOs, and so on to um, do applied research projects on mostly renewable energy topics, including offshore wind, hydrogen, um, uh, energy thermal um, and onshore wind as well. So, and just uh, more as well. If you're interested, you can check out our website on more about what we do. The project that I'm here to represent is the capacity building for the sustainable and inclusive development of Nova Scotia's offshore wind resource. It's quite a mouthful, so I do have to read it out loud um, on the screen. Uh, the project is funded by Natural Resources Canada. So this is through NRCAN's program called uh, the Smart Renewables and Electrification Pathways Program. Um, so this is meant to uh, build knowledge around um, different areas around Canada because it is a, a federal program. Um, and our project is here based in Nova Scotia, specifically about offshore wind. Um, similar to the project led by the Cape Breton Partnership, we're building knowledge in communities, sort of building a baseline of information on offshore wind to encourage people to participate in decisions about the industry. Because it's still really early days, um, and it's really important that people sort of start to get involved in discussion so that their voices can be heard. Um, we're also uh, encouraging participation in the regional assessment for offshore wind in Nova Scotia, which we'll talk more about later in this presentation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, what we'll be discussed today, we're going to discuss why we need more renewable energy. Why we need more renewable energy here in Nova Scotia, as well as an introduction to the technology offshore wind. Regulations in development currently in the province, as well as opportunities to get involved. Next slide. So let's start with why do we need more renewable energy? So, next slide. Um, thank you. So as I mentioned, uh, this aligns very strongly with our organization, Net Zero Atlantic. Um, so I'll just explain the greenhouse gas effect first to begin, so kind of explaining why we have this problem in the first place. 
Uh, so we know that we release emissions through lots of different ways, whether it's driving your car or heating your home or so on. And those emissions include carbon dioxide, methane, and some others. And those get trapped in our atmosphere. Um, so that when they're released, they sort of hang out in the atmosphere and then they capture heat that is um, from the sun. And then that causes a warming effect on the planet. So you've probably heard of global warming, and now it's sort of being referred to as climate change. This is mainly because it's not just having a warming effect, um, this capturing of the heat because of emissions that we're releasing. Uh, it's also causing other effects like uh, increased frequency and severity of storms, as well as uh, changes in, um, uh, in weather, weather patterns such as uh, dryness or dampness. Um, in, sorry, can you, can you go back to the uh, in Nova Scotia specifically, you can see that our emissions over the last couple of years have started to go down. So we are trending in the right direction. However, we do have a target of net zero by 2050, meaning that by 2050 we're going to reduce our emissions as much as we can, but also be able to capture or store any emissions that, are, that we're not able to reduce from our system entirely. Um, carbon, for example, can be reused and, and used as a byproduct, so things like that can be sort of offset the emissions that we can't completely remove from our system. So I mentioned that our emissions come from different sources. You can sort of think of them as being broken down into sectors. So we have agriculture in Nova Scotia, which makes up about 3% of our emissions. We have waste, industry, heat for buildings, and then Transportation and electricity make up the majority of our emissions in Nova Scotia. And this is important um, because we're here to talk mostly about electricity today. Uh, so go to the next slide, please. So in Nova Scotia, our electricity mostly comes from fossil fuels. So these are non-renewable energy sources that release a lot of emissions. So that includes coal, petroleum, natural gas, and so on. And that makes up about two-thirds of our emissions in the province. Uh, or sorry, two-thirds of our electricity that we use in the province. Uh, the reason that this is a concern is because, like I mentioned, it, re it releases a lot of emissions, um, but also it's a finite resource, meaning that we won't be able to always use these because we will run out of them eventually. The other one-third of our electricity comes from renewables, such as solar, wind, and hydro. This is really good because it lowers uh, our greenhouse gas emissions because renewables don't release as many emissions as non-renewables and it is a continuously replenished resource, meaning that we will always have wind and we'll always have sun um, and water will always move around. So, uh, there's also a target in Nova Scotia to increase the amount of electricity produced by renewables to 80% by 2030. So by 2030, we have to increase our amount of electricity produced by renewables to 80% from 33. So again, we sort of have a lot of work to do there, similar to that net zero goal by 2050. Um, this one's coming up only in about six years or so. When we think about offshore wind, we, there are a couple of end uses. It could be used as a source of electricity in our grid system. It could also be used to develop power to produce green hydrogen. If you look up here, you'll see kind of the process that that takes. Now, both of these sources, or both of these end uses, could either be exported, meaning that they would go outside of Nova Scotia, whether that's to a partner country in Europe or to the United States, or they can be used domestically here in Nova Scotia. With hydrogen production, we're looking at a process called electrolysis that requires a significant amount of energy in order to split water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. And that's kind of what makes offshore wind, not kind of, it is what makes offshore wind attractive to that industry. And in order to export it as green, it also has to be produced with renewable energy. So you have to use uh, different types of energy. It can be solar, it could be onshore wind, offshore wind, in order to export it to the European Union. And I'll just briefly go over some of the components of the turbine. I know most of you are probably familiar with what they look like more generally, as you can see the one in West Ayrshire. But the hub is the part that the blades are connected to, and it also has the pitch system, which controls the energy output by shifting the angle of the blades. The blades themselves capture energy and convert it to mechanical energy. 
and that mechanical energy is transformed, transformed into electricity in the nasal, where, which has the components that convert energy. And the tower itself supports all of these components. You'll see on here, this is from the New York State Energy Research Development Authority, that one spin of a turbine, depending on its capacity, can power an average household for more than two days. And that's measured in megawatt hours. When we talk about offshore wind, we typically talk about megawatts and gigawatts. When you look at your power bill, that comes, you're looking at kilowatt hours. So if you're thinking of that in terms of megawatts, there are a thousand kilowatts in a megawatt and a thousand megawatts in a gigawatt. So that kind of gives you an idea of the scale there. And the onshore wind turbines are quite a bit smaller than offshore wind turbines. You'll see the largest anticipated is 5.5 megawatts by 2035. And offshore wind you're looking at 17 megawatts by 2035. These are actually kind of already almost at that point, so they're likely to be even bigger by 2035 as technology develops. And then you'll see the rover diameter is also significantly larger, where some of these are between 120 and 174 meters, where you're looking at 150 to 250 meters for the uh, circumference diameter. And then there are two types of offshore wind turbines. There are fixed bottom and floating. Fixed bottom turbines are when you drill a hole, essentially, into the seabed and you place a long pile which supports the turbine. These are the most common forms of technology because they've been around for a very long time. They've been using these in Europe for close to 30 years, if not over 30 years. So this is the cheapest form of offshore wind that you have. Floating is a newer technology, so it is a bit more expensive. It hasn't been uh, doesn't reach the scale per se. There are some demo projects across the world. In that system, you have moorings that are anchored to the seabed. And an important thing to note is that which turbine you choose is dependent on water depth as well as seabed geology. So for fixed bottom, you're looking at 0 to 60 meters, and then anything above 60 meters would have to be a, a floating turbine. Okay, so something that's helpful when you're trying to sort of conceptualize what these projects might look like is to look at projects that already exist in other places in the world. So this uh, project that I'm showing you here in the bottom photo and the rainbow photos on the, on the side of the screen is called Horn C2, and it's an offshore wind park that came online, meaning that it started to produce power um, available to the grid um, as of 2022. Um, it was, it's located in the North Sea, so off the coast of the UK, and it can generate enough green electricity to power 1.4 million homes. It has a combined capacity of 1.32 gigawatts, and it has 165 turbines, each at a 8 megawatts. Um, so as Jen mentioned, uh, the technology of course is developing pretty rapidly. So um, as these projects continue to be developed over time, uh, 8 megawatts will probably um, be considered smaller, uh, but there are also projects that are older that have uh, turbines about 1 to 2 megawatts. Um, it's about one, 189 kilometers off uh, the coast, and it takes up a total area of 462 square kilometers. So I'm just going to use this clicker, so this gray area, um, that's labeled P2, that's the project that I'm referring to. And we also have P1 and P3. Those are other projects that are sort of uh, made by the same people in the same area. That's uh, Horn C1, we're talking about Horn C2 and Horn C3. Horn C1 came online, I think, in 2019, and uh, Horn C3 will come online in the next couple of years. Um, but these together are going to produce a lot of power, are producing a lot of power for the UK. Um, it's interesting when you look at sort of the, the scale doesn't really mean a lot when you look at it uh, in this blown or zoomed in map here. But when you look at this map of the UK, you can see that this little square that's on the map is the area that we're looking at currently. So these areas that, you know, this one, this gray one takes up 462 square kilometers. These ones take up probably a similar amount of space, would only be a small dot on this uh, blown out map of the UK um, entirely. 
So just to kind of give you a reference of how much power these can produce and how much area they take up, of course it will vary based on the size of the project, where it is, um, and the turbine themselves. And as Jen mentioned, the uh, technology is developing over the next few years, the turbines will be able to produce more power, so there will probably be less turbines to produce more power, um, and the projects will be at larger scale. So why are we looking at offshore wind here? So wind, believe it or not, and we're really used to wind here in Nova Scotia, but it's not an equally distributed resource. Um, if you look at that map on the left, the areas that have the purple are areas offshore that have winds of um, 10 meters per second or higher. Um, so Nova Scotia is a part of that. Um, we're so lucky with our amazing winds. Uh, you can also see that um, it's quite much the same in areas up here where there is actually quite a bit of offshore wind established already, um, or in this area. So if we look at the the graph on the right, that's total installations offshore that currently exist as of uh, the end of 2022, which is a total of about 64 gigawatts worldwide. So that offshore wind globally that's currently installed, there is um, offshore wind in Denmark, Netherlands, Germany, the UK, China over the last few years has really rapidly increased their development, so now they have a um, majority of that development off their shores. Um, and then the rest of the world and other areas like Thailand and so take up about the rest of the 9% um, of that global distribution. So if we zoom in a little bit more on Nova Scotia specifically, we can see that our wind resource is in this darker red area over 10 meters per second. Um, so it goes up to I think 11 in some of these areas. And then it's um, about 9 to 10 in some of these other darker red offshore. Generally still a very, very strong resource. Um, it is considered world class. Um, kind of funny to think of wind as a resource and thinking of it as world class, um, but in the topic of offshore wind it is. And you can see also the comparison between onshore and offshore. So onshore the wind speeds vary between 6 to 7 to up towards to 8 in some areas, but it's definitely a lot stronger offshore. So offshore winds are not only typically higher, but they're also more consistent, meaning that it's more power that you can use to generate electricity. So we mentioned water depth already, um, but just to show this map here, you can also see that the depth of our offshore does vary, and I'm sure especially fishers and other ocean users are pretty familiar with the bathymetry. Um, but you can see that this area around Sable Island, the Sable Island Bank, is shallower. It's between 0 and 60 meters in depth. So that, as well as Middle Bank and some areas close to shore, are suitable for fixed bottom, as Jen was explaining before. Um, and then other areas that are deeper than that are potential for floating, um, where the depth is a little bit more um, flexibility there. Um, yeah, that's about it for that side. So when we map the offshore in terms of cost, uh, this study from Anchor Insights uh, that came out earlier this year um, looked at the levelized cost of electricity for offshore wind based on a couple of different things. So average annual wind speed, obviously the cost of electricity when you're using a resource like wind is going to, uh, is going to rely a lot on the quality of the wind, um, as well as the water depth. Um, because it depends on what type of turbines you've used uh, in certain areas of the offshore. So the depth is pretty important because the type of turbine depends on the depth. As well as the distance to construction ports and grid connection. So the areas closer to shore that are green, uh, as we noticed on that last map, are shallower. They're also obviously close to shore, so less cost for transmitting the electricity to shore. Sable Bank and Middle Bank are also considered lower cost because they're shallower, currently suitable for fixed turbines, fixed bottom turbines. Fixed bottom is currently cheaper, um, but that's based off of current expenses. Floating is expected to come down over the next several years. When we start to look at some of the considerations that need to be um, analyzed for offshore wind development, here, this is just an example of a study um, from the same uh, paper as the last map that I showed. 
This is one study that's looking at different um, constraints or characteristics of the ocean use um, and how it impacts where turbines could be put. This is not final in any way, and this is not telling us, well, this, oh great, this is where we'll put turbines. This is just one study's opinion. Um, so it's important to take it with a grain of salt, but also helpful to see how some of these studies are done and what information is being taken into consideration. So we see the catch per weight for uh, lobster fishing um, that is represented by these uh, colors and these sort of squares, um, mostly on the south shore and then some up here as well. We also have fishing intensity, so the orange <coughs> that's pretty much everywhere and the darker oranges represent more fishing intensity. We also have protected areas, some marine protected areas, refuges, and uh, species at risk areas that are all represented on this map, as well as the cost that we looked at on the previous map. So when you overlay all of these different factors, you can figure out what are the areas with the least amount of constraints and where should we develop based on that. So that's what those red circles represent. Um, again, this is one study that was done there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of figuring out where turbines should go. So fishing um, grounds is an important factor to consider, of course, as well as marine protected areas, seabirds, marine wildlife habitats, and shipping routes. This map doesn't cover all of those things, um, and there are other maps from the same study that do look at those. Um, but this is just an example of one study that can combine and how you can sort of look at that. Victoria mentioned that uh, the province has decided to pause exploring development in provincial waters until the regional assessment process is finished. So we're looking at these jointly managed waters that were established under the Accord Act in the 1990s, or 1980s actually, when the Offshore Oil and Gas Board was formed, Offshore Petroleum Board, sorry. And then this area here, and we'll discuss the regional assessment next, but this area all around is the study area, so that is where data will be. And when we're talking about the regional assessment, we're talking about the regional assessment for offshore wind development in Nova Scotia. It is led by an independent committee that was appointed by the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Its purpose is to inform and improve future planning, licensing, and impact assessment processes to protect the environment, health, social, and economic conditions while creating opportunities for sustainable and as I mentioned earlier, this is where all of the data collection is coming from. It's an information-driven process. They'll be gathering information from indigenous communities, knowledge holders, fishers, ocean users, scientific community, everybody that has information to offer, essentially. And the general public. You can also, as Victoria said, go on the registry and make a comment yourself as well. So they will, from that data, recommend geographic areas that will be considered for future development and provide recommendations to government for how to mitigate and monitor any future potential projects using baseline data collective. The regional assessment has to consider these impacts. They're, it's in their mandate. And they have to consider not only the negative impacts, but the positive impacts as well. So I have categorized these to three sections, but many of these fall into multiple categories. If you're looking at some of the economic factors, you can look at fisheries and other ocean uses, the economy more broadly, which could look like tax revenues, job creation. For environmental impacts, they will be looking at air quality and greenhouse gases, marine fish and marine habitats, marine and migratory birds, and bats marine mammals and sea turtles, as well as the acoustic environment and the impact that that has on, that that would have on some of these other uh, species, which is uh, known as a cumulative effect. And then when you're looking at social, they will be considering indigenous communities, their activities, interests, and rights. Visual aesthetics, so that's view planes, um, which is a concern for people who are in tourism. Communities. And the physical and cultural heritage is things like shipwrecks and archaeological sites. They have to study those as well. And then the protected and special areas are what we're looking at when we talk about marine protected areas. There's other processes happening alongside the regional assessment. It's, the regional assessment is the primary process that's happening. 
But Natural Resources Canada is also developing their offshore renewable energy regulations, and those apply to the offshore area that's managed by the federal government, so outside the jointly managed waters. When they're looking at that, they'll be looking at safety and environmental protection, particularly, and that's through all phases of the project's life cycle. So it's not just operations, it will be from when they identify sites straight through to decommissioning. And in terms of implementation, the industry will be regulated, the industry will be regulated by the Canada Offshore Petroleum, Canada Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board, which has already shifted its mandate. Uh, the government has amended the Accord Act so that they are now the Canada Nova Scotia Offshore Energy Regulator. The amendments to this happened just a few months ago. And then it, provincially you have the government of Nova Scotia has released their offshore wind roadmap. This is a preliminary document. Um, they're continuing to do engagement with communities and looking at uh, supply chain development for that, but they are again focused on allowing the regional assessment process and these other regulations to be developed before they consider any sort of development in provincial waters. So, coming back to how to stay involved. With the regional assessment, they'll be hosting open house sessions being planned. The ones that they had held before were similar to the poster boards and the committee members were present. There were maps, you can leave comments on the poster boards, which you can also do here as well. We also have feedback forms at the back of the, uh, on the table at back. If you wanted to fill that out, if you have comments that you want us to pass on to the regional assessment, you can do that. Um, we'd be happy to do that for you. Written submissions can be made via their email or on the public comment tool, which is on the registry. So you'll see the email here, which is probably difficult to type into your phone. Again, we will provide you with that link on our website. And then again, they're seeking advisory group participants still. So Indigenous fisheries and other ocean users and scientific information and community knowledge. As for the partnership, we'll continue to administer our green energy engagement program. We're hoping to host some webinars in the new year. Um, no dates yet, but we're hoping to take an international uh, approach. We'd like to have experts from different areas across the world who are bringing new information, and you can ask them questions about what their experience has been, what their knowledge is in other areas. Uh, we're currently in phase one of our project, so that includes these sessions as well as ones on the mainland. Um, so we're focusing on rural communities across the entire province as well as working with our Indigenous partners at the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq and the Unabagi Institute of Natural Resources to um, continue dialogue with Indigenous communities across the province as well. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is phase one. These initial sort of providing baseline information, uh, collecting comments and questions, and then next year we'll come back in phase two, uh, along with partnership um, to talk to communities again and sort of bring a community co-created plan to you guys based on how these initial sessions went, what we heard from you, uh, what you wanted to hear more about, we'll hopefully come back next year with more information because um, things are constantly progressing and there's always more uh, to update on. Um, our website, netzeroatlantic.ca, we have an offshore wind page you can go to that talks specifically about our project and we also have webinars as well um, that you can watch that were recorded from previous webinars. We had one last week on offshore wind and impacts to birds, uh, so it may be interesting for some of you if you want to check it out and, and learn more about that. We'll return to the Discoos Civic Improvement Centre for more of the offshore wind information session in just a few minutes. But right now, here's our feature interview on Tell Ill 24-7 this week. I got to speak with the Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables for Nova Scotia, Tory Rushton, about his province's new Green Hydrogen Action Plan. You're also going to hear about how the Strait Area played a key role in putting this action plan together. Here's my conversation with Minister Tory Rushton right now. Minister Rushton, thank you for joining me on Tell Ill 24-7 today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Well, we'll hit the ground running. We have a green hydrogen action plan with seven goals and 23 additional action items that are part of achieving these goals. 
Can you tell me a little bit about the consultation process for getting this all together? Uh, were you speaking to industries? Were you speaking to municipal leaders? Uh, who basically was involved in putting this all together and what was that process like? Yeah, certainly. The, 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 this is a build out of many conversations, uh, local, uh, local communities, uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, the local indigenous communities, uh, uh, and, and, and quite frankly, uh, hearing from jurisdictions all over the world about what, uh, what green hydrogen means to, 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 to everyone and the, and the transition to green energy. So th- this is something that, uh, we, we certainly haven't taken lightly over the last, uh, last few years. And, uh, we're ex- very excited to have this plan put in place today. All right, let's talk a bit about that transition. And it seems like the clock is ticking on a lot of these things. Obviously, Nova Scotia has a renewables target that it needs to hit by 2030, especially in terms of getting the province off coal. One of the major players in green hydrogen in the Strait area, Everwind Fuels, now looking for a 2025 launch of its first phase of its major plan, construction going right now. How difficult was this all to put together, knowing that the timelines are accelerating in terms of renewable energy, both provincially and federally? And did that put extra pressure on you and your department to get this all together? Yeah, no, certainly. I, I, I would say yes, uh, to, to be very upfront. There, there, there was some pressure uh, to, to, to get it uh, in, in a timely response, timely manner. Um, but uh, to, to be very honest, it's, it's an exciting time. Um, when uh, when you have ever have have a new sector such as, as green hydrogen, something that was never even in the uh, vocabulary of this government when we were initially elected in uh, in the uh, summer of 2021, and uh, shortly thereafter, the world was looking for green hydrogen. Um, we. Uh, we know that we have some of the best wind regimes um, in, in the world. And when, when the whole world was looking at Nova Scotia to be a key role player in this, we were very excited to, to learn about green hydrogen, to learn about the, uh, the, the transition. And uh, we, we certainly have made, uh, made strides to, to be a part of this sector. And uh, for, for once, we, we actually see where Nova Scotia uh, has the opportunity to, to be an exporter of energy, but not just energy. Um, green energy that that the whole world is looking for is, uh, 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 at this present time. It's remarkable how for many, many years Nova Scotia was always looking to uh, import uh, energy fuels and, and such. And when, when we're looking at this with our wind regimes, with our, uh, our, our, our map way to a 2030 uh, renewable energy targets that we do have, and, and the prosperity of, of the green hydrogen aspect uh, at our fingertips, we, ha- we do have a whole world looking at us and looking at Eastern Canada, for that matter, uh, of how we are going to make that transition. But we're also assisting uh, many other jurisdictions in the world uh, when we're having those conversations that they they want to be the first off takers of our green hydrogen as we build that out at, at the export level and lo- look at it at a scale level where we can u- utilize it also domestically. Well, let's talk a bit about domestic use. And I mean, obviously, this is part of Nova Scotia's renewable strategy to meet its deadlines by 2030 and going beyond, of course. What can you tell me about how this action plan will help to make sure that the green hydrogen being produced here in Nova Scotia is going to be used for renewable energy sources and for power sources here in Nova Scotia as time goes on? No, I, I, absolutely. It, it, as, as we move through, through this plan and the different goals and targets that are in this plan, um, we know that we have to build a, uh, a responsible uh, uh, regulatory regime in that and uh, and, and ensure the, the safety of our environment, the safety of our province. We know that we uh, we, we need to uh, build up this, the skilled trades that are going to be needed, uh, uh, that there's estimates of uh, uh, thousands of skilled trades that are going to need to to build this out, but also maintain the, uh, the whole process as it, as it moves out. But as we transition from the other, uh, the, the modern day uh, energy forms, uh, how do those skilled trades uh, transition into a green green uh, aspect or green green trades uh, concept? And, and the, the, the very exciting thing that uh, is taking place is prior to uh, politics, I come from the trade sector. And when I see young people that are looking at trades uh, uh, to be part of their uh, post-secondary education, they're actually talking to how that green 
green uh, uh, world or the, the new green era will be part of their uh, education and, and uh, certainly part of their career path forward. And and now they're actually looking at Nova Scotia as being home, where previously we, we actually used to train trades and export them. So it's, a, it's another uh, resource that we're going to keep Nova Scotians right here and actually draw more people. Minister Rushton, I'm glad you brought up that aspect of the Green Hydrogen Action Plan because I did want to ask you, do you see a possibility for the community college system here in Nova Scotia to be part of that skilled trades development? I mean, obviously, we look at Strait Area Campus right here in this area in Port Hawkesbury, but there could be other campuses around the province as well. You may or may not be able to answer this question right at this point, but do you see a role for the NSCC system in this regard? Absolutely, um, and I and I say that uh, with excitement. Um, certainly not my my role as Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables, but certainly we have we have conversations with uh, labor, and uh, we also have uh, conversations with advanced education uh, that that would have that regular conversation with NSCC. Every time I have a chance to, to visit my local NSCC in, in uh, the, the Cumberland campus at, uh, at Spring Hill, I talk to those people about trades. Every time that I get to meet President uh, Don Bureau of uh, NSCC, I talk to him about the trades and the trades people that we are going to need for this green transition. And look, they I, I certainly feel that they share the same excitement that, uh, that I feel of, of how things are going to transition and how we can, can start to keep Nova Scotians that are being educated here, how we can keep them here, but also be a magnet to draw people in. And and what more, better way to do that is as we uh, build out the, the green hydrogen aspect. Now, Minister, this is a 43-page document, seven goals and 23 action items on top of that. Obviously, I'm not looking for you to crunch all that down into 30 seconds or 60 seconds, but are there one or two other parts of this plan that you really want Nova Scotians to know about as you're introducing it to the public right now? This is something that is going to be built out here in Nova Scotia. I, I, I fully believe that we have the opportunity and the capability with our, our experience, highly technical people here in, the, here in the province, we can build this out here in Nova Scotia. We can be a key player to produce energy um, to the rest of the world, where for many years we've been importing. We can be an exporter of energy and we can build a, a fulsome economy in around this energy sector. And... and just imagine what we, we can do with that. Uh, we, we campaigned on health care, and we need to pay for that in one way or form. We campaigned on the idea that we want to build Nova Scotia's population. This is one of the ways that we are going to build uh, Nova Scotia's population, but not just build it in, uh, for the transition to build out, but build it for a long-term population growth. All right, one last question to you, Minister Rushton, and that's on the role of the strait in developing this green hydrogen sector. I noted with some interest when the initial press release went out that there were also quotes from the mayor of Port Hawkesbury, Brenda Chisholm Beaton, and the warden of Richmond County, Amanda Mubberkett, both co-chairs of the Strait Area Offshore Wind Task Force. Can you talk a bit about their role and the role of the strait area in general in terms of putting this green hydrogen action plan together? Absolutely. Actually, uh, to, to be very honest, when green hydrogen did come to my table, it wasn't on my mandate letter. When it did come to the table, uh, that group from the straight area was the very first group that I met with as minister and uh, certainly saw and, and recognized the their enthusiasm about offshore wind and the possibility about green hydrogen and and certainly uh, felt that in the room in that in that meeting we've carried on those conversations that group have done a fantastic job not just for the straight area but for all of nova scotia to to show what can be possible with with this and look just a, a, a quick tip of the hat to that group they've done a fantastic job they put a lot of hard work into this and uh, and, and quite frankly they've done some consultation in the communities that have certainly made this job a lot easier so a huge thank you to that group as well all right those are all the formal questions i had minister rushton did you want to add anything else about all of this just before we wrap up no, look, I appreciate this. This is something we're very, very excited about as a government and uh, very pleased to be able to get this out before the end of the calendar year. And uh, certainly with the holiday season uh, before us, there'll be a lot of time for people to uh, digest this uh, this form and certainly look to have any, any conversations about this in the very near future in the new year. Well, as we prepare to have a green Christmas, it looks like it's going to be a green hydrogen Christmas as well. We appreciate you giving us a couple of minutes here to help go through this plan and talk about it. Minister Rushton, thank you for joining me on Till Ill 24-7 today. 
Thank you so much, and everyone stay safe. Tori Rushton is Nova Scotia's Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables. Stay tuned for more of Telil 24-7 in just a moment. And now we'd like to return you to the Discoose Civic Improvement Centre for more footage filmed by my Telil News colleague Jacqueline Girouar of the information session on offshore wind that took place on Monday afternoon, December the 11th. As you're about to hear from several members of the public, the move towards offshore wind development in our area isn't unanimous. There were concerns raised by several local residents and homeowners and those involved in the fishery sector. So you're going to hear a variety of opinions over the next 20 minutes. Let's take you to that public gallery session at the Discoose Civic Improvement Center right now. This is about like migrating marine life. Um, especially for the floating ones, that one confused me a bit if there's any animals migrating underneath these floating turbines. So migratory pathways are considered um, as, a, as um, uh, a list of things for, the, not a constraint, I don't want to call it that, but a sort of when you're looking at where to put turbines. Um, so you can map migratory pathways, something that DFO has done over many, many years. So when looking at um, development in Nova Scotia, we actually have some maps later that show um, some examples of, of how you can map those things and how you can use that information to figure out where to put turbines. So those things are taken into consideration, um, and usually those areas are avoided. What yeah. confuses me the most, I guess, is I'm a fisherman, and they're trying to get us to take ropes out of the water, but then the government is here and saying, let's put these things in the water, when the whole point is to try to take objects out of the water to make it a lot easier for whales and other sea life to come true. So fishing, obviously, especially in Nova Scotia, is a huge industry that needs, fisher needs need to be taken into consideration. Um, with where to put the turbines, how it's going to impact livelihoods of people um, who depend on ocean use. So those are things that I can't really speak to you being told to remove ropes um, from, uh, from the ocean, but uh, there is, there's um, definitely a lot of conversations currently happening between us being here, the regional assessment, uh, provincial government talking to folks. So there is a lot of engagement happening with fishers. Um, and there are opportunities to get involved and have more discussions, and we'll speak to more of those later. Um, but there are a lot, or there is a lot of effort currently being put into making sure that impacts to livelihoods are, are being reduced. Um, but it's definitely something that is really important to talk about and to raise concerns about. You wouldn't have mines in the water if it's a fixed space. If it's, you're talking about a floating. Uh, Turbine. Yeah, so for, for both types, um, fishers will, uh, fisher needs will be taken into consideration for, for both types. Um, the impacts of the different types of turbines vary. I just Googled it, uh, Warren Sea UK, and how the fishery is affected. And it says fishing is usually forbidden around these installations. It also says fishermen are at risk accidental damage to their equipment. So some have, fisheries might have to relocate given the growing access restrictions. Yeah. And, and it's, un it's unique to every geographic area and it'll depend significantly on what the government decides for regulations. In other areas, the fishers are allowed to fish with the farms themselves. So it is really dependent. And we don't know yet, unfortunately, because those regulations are still in development. But if that's a concern that you would like us to voice to the regional assessment, we can absolutely pass that as a Can I ask you about Hornsey Offshore Wind Park? Do you know how many wind turbines are being used to uh, produce power for 1.4 million homes? Yeah, it's um, 165 turbines in that park uh, for Horn C2, and then there are, um, I don't know the exact number for the other two uh, farms or parks. Um, I also use the word farm and park interchangeably, just they, are, they do mean the same thing. Um, so uh, there's 165 for that gray portion on that map, and then the other two have um, in a, a number I don't know off the top of my head. And how close to shore is that? Like if we're talking about how it impacts local fisheries, how close to shore are those, are they within the fishing boundaries of local fishermen? So this one is about 200 kilometers offshore, 189 kilometers. Uh, so it is further away, it's not super near the 
for sure. So here that would be comparable to somewhat close to Sable Island. Um, but so obviously uh, fishing areas also change from year to year. So I've heard from other fishers. Um, well, they can. So uh, it's it's done. this one's further. There are some examples of offshore wind farms or parks that are closer to shore. Um, so that's why sort of when you're figuring out where to put them, it's really important to have conversations with stakeholders and other ocean users to figure out uh, how people might be impacted, how to avoid impacts uh, when possible. Um, yeah, so this one, as obviously, uh, as you mentioned, there's uh, impacts to fishers, there are restrictions regarding that, but it's going to be different from area to area. We don't know in Nova Scotia yet what it will look like. Based on the scale of these things, and because I'm picking up on your point that you made earlier about rope, kind of. Yeah, but these like, are not, these are not rope, these are cables, these would be cables. There's not going to be a same thing in the tank, necessarily, right? Like, well, they're saying my piece of create rope, which is about the size of your finger, right. is a risk of entanglement. So how can you come and tell me that a big steel cable is not? Well, like, because like, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be as flexible, is what I'm thinking. But well, that's just, a, that's a way. They'd have to be flexible of some sort, because that yeah. is moving know, with, with the sea, because it's, but it wouldn't there be is like still a risk of entanglement. Yeah. No, sure, with my well, trap, the whale can hook it and drag it. That, the whale hooks mm -hmm. it, it ain't going nowhere. I, the whale I think the fear with fishing is that there is more of them and they can break loose and gather together, whereas with this, it's very unlikely they can break loose. Oh, Are there studies around that kind of thing? Like, we should probably start to feel other examples from Europe to your point. Mm -hmm. With flooding, specifically? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty new. It is new. Yeah. There's only an installation office of there's four in total, I think, that are currently like pilot projects, um, but they're all small, like a couple dozen megawatts, I think. Um, so they're smaller scale. Yeah, um, I'm thinking of these cables, though, that like, even if they're not tangleable, how do we know that the marine life have the ability to travel around them? Because if you smack face first into a steel cable, it's still going to hurt you. So I'm thinking about like seal and whales, stuff like that. Um, is it still going to injure the lava? Well, I mean, there are things in the water now that they... Right, you know what I mean. Like, I'm thinking it's a large enough thing. I'm thinking you can just go oh, smash it. <laughs> oh, but I don't know. I'm not a seal. <laughs> yeah, so there's... Uh, right now, because it is a newer technology, there aren't a lot of studies released on it, especially ones that have been around long enough. Um, projects that have been around long enough to get valid uh, research out of. Um, so it's hard to say right now what the direct impact is to wildlife, but there have there is monitoring of that. Um, there's just not currently released research that's established. So um, the province announced maybe two weeks ago now that they are no longer looking at developing uh, or looking at leasing land or seabed that's inshore or near shore, which is um, like Chukchukto Bay, for example. So they're not looking. They yeah, paused. They paused, they paused yeah. it. So that's not going to be explored um, as long as the regional assessment is happening, which is looking at jointly managed waters, which is further offshore. Yeah, the regional assessment is gathering all of that information. They're gathering it from fishers and ocean users. They're gathering it from indigenous knowledge holders, scientific researchers, the general public. They're taking all of that information and once they analyze that information, that's when they'll make uh, recommendations for siting, which is essentially why we're here to gather some of this feedback to bring back to that process and to help you navigate uh, how to be involved in that process on an ongoing basis. I do know for a fact, because I fish all Cancel Bank, Middle Bank, and Sable Bank, there's not a whole lot of fishing activity right up on the bank itself. But when you start getting out in the gutters, which are literally your shallow ear and gutters drop off, you're talking a stone throw away, and there's heavy fishing activity right on the edges of the banks, and multiple, multiple boats fishing different species all at once on those tree banks. I know I was there all summer, this summer, for instance. I've been there for the last six summers. And on all three of those banks, there is some very heavy holiday and prey fishing activities from multiple months at a time. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and these maps also are, are like the data from fishing. Is I'm not sure off the top of my head when that fishing data is from or where it's from. Um, but the regional assessment, which we keep we keep referring to this regional assessment that we haven't gotten to speak very much about yet, but it is uh, it will come after this. Um, but that process, they are specifically looking for updated data on, on fishing areas as well as speaking directly to fishers across communities. So. We're happy to take information from these sessions to that committee, as well as encourage people like yourself to go to that committee and speak to them directly. Where do you propose to put the plant? What's going to take the power from the turbines? None of that has been determined yet. And you're that going to have to run the cable from yeah. the turbine. From the turbine. turbine. All the way to the inshore, right? Yeah. Okay. And that has been decided. And you won't be allowed to fix around your cables. I've seen, I've seen in, that was an example, I think the example was in Europe. They almost have like a floating substation. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. offshore, we weren't allowed near those pipes that ran inshore. And the same thing is going to happen with the cables. We've got 165 turbines. I don't anticipate, though, that you'd have 165 cables coming ashore. They're going to have to. I mean, that's yeah, the models I've like seen so far, but they have to come together. Somewhere at some point, but how far in before they come together, right? Yeah, I don't know. 400 square kilometers. And none of that has been decided yet. And no social power will also be involved in that process too. I'll gather new and old information and statistics are important in the new and this region. It takes time. There's a lot of data to, to gather and analyze. There's a five person committee. Um, the process started earlier this year and will go until September 2024. There's also advisory committees. There's advisory committees for uh, indigenous peoples, fishers, as well as the scientific community. So you can actually uh, write an expression of interest to become a member of these advisory committees. You can also submit your comments more generally. Everything will be considered in this process. Um, the last time the regional assessment committee came through, they did not hold a session in Richmond County. <laughs> So I've invited them to do so, and they've committed to doing that probably early in the year or so. <coughs> Just for folks to stay tuned for that, it's important that they, they make sure that they get yeah. their courage. They are planning to, to do a session in, I think a couple of sessions probably, yeah. in Richmond County in January. Yes, the intention, but we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Um, Any idea of when that process will be completed? They're hoping by September 2024, so next year. And where can people go to look at the comments that I have had so far? We will bring that up in just a few minutes. It's also on one of our posters. And it is on, yes, it's on this poster right here. And on our program page, you can see a QR code behind Victoria. We're going to post, and we are going to post important links um, we can post the maps that Victoria had for the Anchor Insight Report, as well as the link for the registry and the email, because you can sign up for the newsletter and get more information that way as well. Is Net Zero exploring other forms of carbon neutral energy other than offshore wind? Yeah, so we uh, look at all topics related to advancing the region to carbon neutrality, so that includes geothermal, hydrogen, we have our own energy system model that we created as well, um, and we're not pro certain technologies, so we're not pro offshore wind, we're just researching the topic because it is a tool that could be used to advance our region to carbon neutrality. So that's why we are um, doing this, this work on it, but we do also have research on other topics, other projects. Um, on other topics related to renewable energy as well as behavioral change related to climate change. Um, yeah, so a couple of different areas in the field. Is this presentation available on your website? It will be available on the Cape Breton Partnership website um, this week, I think. Specifically, yeah. if you go to the website on that QR code, yeah, like it's a QR code. <laughs> that QR code. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention that the regional assessment will be publishing their preliminary, their first draft of the report of the data that they've gathered in March. And that will also go out for public comment. So if you sign up for their email list, you can, they will notify you when that report becomes available. You can review it and you can comment on it. So that is 
another level of engagement that you can do in this process too. I think the most useful thing for us is to find out how it's working in other parts of the world. Like, um, they've had it for 30, 40 years in the North Sea. Why can't we talk about what, how that's affected fishing, how that's affected? They already know it's decimating the birds. So what's the line there? Okay, we're going to decimate this number of birds and this number of birds. So we know they're bad. And um, they're not fishing anything around those food farms. They're allowed to go into them to fish. This one, there's no fish. So what's the stats on that? Are there no fish there because the North Sea is fished out? Or are there no fish there because of the turbines? See, these are the facts that are already in the world. So let's hear them. It's also a bit challenging to blame it solely on the turbines because there's well, other... Like said, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, maybe the North Sea is just fished out, but there's people fishing in the North Sea. And there's also so just hundreds of turbines. They've been there for 20, 30 years. Were there no fish studies done before the turbines were put in? There, there must be ongoing studies into the effect that these things have. So they have 30 years experience. Well, let's hear it, let's hear it. That's the most important thing right there, because it doesn't matter we're in a different area. The bottom line is, if that's affecting the fish, it's affecting the fish. So I know that the regional assessment is actively speaking with fishers in other jurisdictions to, to identify the impacts that have happened to the fisheries in those areas. That work is ongoing. There is likely academic studies on the impacts. Um, that is something that we can look into. We can write a report and post that on our website. We do have... It, it's really... It is difficult. Well, it, it seems to me that this whole thing you're just sitting around kind of going, okay, the oceans is good for whatever, whatever you want. But you're guessing. Until you actually put 50 out there, you're not actually going to know what the impacts are. So I don't understand. Why would you not put 10 or 20 out there? Find out what happens. Experimental. But, but they should already know that information. You can put it in like the sea life. Well, they know it from the North Sea. Uh, depending on where they put their turbine. <laughs> I would assume they're going to pick areas with uh, less less bird life. We're not everywhere, but, and the, the people that say that turbines are killer birds, uh, that's not really true. It's the bigger the turbine, the smaller the sting, the more the birds have a chance to deviate from them, so there's a lot of disinformation. They've also made a lot of progress in terms of learning lessons from what went wrong. So in terms of birds, I know that they're likely to leave them outside of migratory paths so that they're not encountering those on their migration south. There's also the possibility of um, placing them so that birds aren't flying into them particularly, as well as uh, things like lights on the blades. That's some measures that they've taken in Europe for birds specifically. <laughs> There's also a technology that uh and emit a sound that birds can hear so that it's at a certain frequency so that it will deter them from so there's like research that's going into how to mitigate impacts from birds hitting turbines um, and i mentioned that webinar that happened last week on that zero minute website that is up now um, if you're interested in, in watching that i don't know what the answer is but there's got to be some kind of tool well i don't think they know the answer well, it's good that we have discussions over what should happen. And the opportunity to actually provide information to people. I think everybody sees what's happening with the environment, so we need to do something. Something has to be done. Yeah. That, there's no question about that. And there you have it. That wraps up this week's edition of Telil 24-7. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you to my interview guests this week, Nova Scotia Natural Resources and Renewables Minister, Tori Rushton. And a big thank you to my colleague in the Telil News Department, Jacqueline Gerwar, for the use of her footage from the Discoose Civic Improvement Center's offshore wind information session. If you have any thoughts about what you've seen here on Telil 24-7 over the past hour, or just some suggestions for future editions of the show, you can contact me directly or contact Telil Community Television in Arishat. And be sure to follow Telil on social media. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for joining me for this week's edition of Telil 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now. <laughs>